We're turning to 1st Kings this morning, the first book of Kings. And chapter 13. First book of Kings, chapter 13. And behold, there came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord unto Bethel. And Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. And he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord. Behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name, and upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord hath spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent, and the ashes that are upon it shall be poured out. It came to pass, when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, which had cried against the altar in Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, Lay hold on him. And his hand, which he put forth against him, dried up, so that he could not pull it in again to him. The altar also was rent, and the ashes poured out from the altar, according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. The king answered and said unto the man of God, Entreat now the face of the Lord thy God, and pray for me, that my hand may be restored me again. And the man of God besought the Lord, and the king's hand was restored him again, and became as he was before. And the king said unto the man of God, Come home with me, and refresh thyself, and I will give thee a reward. And the man of God said unto the king, If thou wilt give me half thine house, I will not go in with thee, neither will I eat bread nor drink water in this place. For so was it charged me by the word of the Lord, saying, Eat no bread, nor drink water, nor turn again by the same way that thou camest. So he went another way, and returned not by the way that he came to Bethel. Now there dwelt an old prophet in Bethel, and his sons came and told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel, the words which he had spoken unto the king, them they told also to their father. And their father said unto them, What way went he? For his sons had seen what way the man of God went which came from Judah and he said unto his sons saddle me the ass so they saddled him the ass and he rode thereon and went after the man of God and found him sitting under an oak and he said unto him art thou the man of God that camest from Judah and he said I am then he said unto him come home with me and eat bread and he said I may not return with thee nor go in with thee neither will I eat bread nor drink water with thee in this place for he was said to me by the word of the Lord, Thou shalt eat no bread, and drink, and nor drink water there, nor turn again to go by the way that thou camest. He said unto him, I am a prophet also, as thou art. And an angel spake unto me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with thee into thine house, that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied unto him. So he went back with him, and did eat bread at his house, and drank water. And it came to pass, as they sat at the table, that the word of the Lord came unto the prophet that had brought him back. And he cried unto the man of God that came from Judah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, For as much as thou hast disobeyed the mouth of the Lord, and hast not kept thy commandment, the commandment which the Lord thy God commanded thee, but camest back, and hast eaten bread, and drunk water in the place of the which the Lord did say to thee, Eat no bread, and drink no water, thy carcass shall not come unto the sepulchre of thy fathers. It came to pass, after he had eaten bread, and after he had drunk, that he saddled for him the ass, to wit, for the prophet whom he had brought back, and when he was gone, a lion met him by the way and slew him. And his carcass was cast in the way, and the ass stood by it. The lion also stood by the carcass. And behold, men passed by and saw the carcass cast in the way, and the lion standing by the carcass, and they came and told it in the city where the old prophet dwelt. And when the prophet that brought him back from the way heard thereof, he said, It is the man of God who was disobedient unto the word of the Lord. Therefore the Lord hath delivered him unto the lion, which hath torn him, and slain him, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake unto him. He spake to his son, saying, Saddle me the ass. And they saddled him. And he went and found his carcass cast in the way, and the ass and the lion standing by the carcass. The lion had not eaten the carcass, nor torn the ass. And the prophet took up the carcass of the man of God, and laid it upon the ass, and brought it back. And the old prophet came to the city to mourn and to bury him. And he laid his carcass in his own grave, and they mourned over him, saying, Alas, my brother. It came to pass, after he had buried him, that he spake to his son, saying, When I am dead, 
then bury me in the sepulchre where the man of God is buried. Lay my bones beside his bones. For the same which he cried by the word of the Lord against the altar in Bethel, and against all the houses of the high places which are in the cities of Samaria, shall surely come to pass. After this thing, Jeroboam returned not from his evil way, but made a gain of the lowest of the people, priests of the high places, whosoever would, he consecrated him, and he became one of the priests of the high places. And this thing became sin unto the house of Jeroboam, even to cut it off, and to destroy it from off the face of the earth. Um, but I was thinking in the week, we, we looked at counting our blessings on Wednesday, and I thought we might continue with that this morning, but mm-hmm. wasn't too sure about that. Then in the, I was up one mm-hmm. in the week, and this passage came to me again. So, so here we are once more, but I've uh, not got the same old notes. I don't tend to do that if I can help it. It's a different message, but there will be some crossovers maybe with some of the things I've said before. What we have in this chapter is a lesson in separation. Not very popular these days separation what do we mean by that we mean keeping ourselves from the world that's what separation means being separated from the world unto the lord and this chapter is a lesson in separation and we're just going to look at a few verses i'm going to pick out a few verses uh, that on this most recent reading have stood out to me verse two and he cried against the altar in the word of the lord he cried against the altar god hated this idolatrous altar this is king jeroboam just after the division of the kingdoms 10 kingdoms of israel the tribes of israel and two to rehoboam solomon's son and no sooner has jeroboam become king of the northern 10 tribes that he sets up a golden calf because he'd just come back from egypt as well and he'd seen it down there sets up a golden calf so there is idolatry now being practiced by these 10 tribes and god hated the altar and the service and therefore a man of God will hate it too where there is no love there will be no hate that is where there's no love for one thing there will be no hatred for its opposite and uh, you know I've said to you before that the aim today of so many in our society is to make us all into clones to make us all the same to make us passionless whatever we do we mustn't say anything that sounds like hatred and we get to the stage where if we're not careful we won't be able to speak at all maybe that's what they want i don't know but those who love the name of jesus cannot sit by in silence while his cross is slighted and his salvation contradicted someone said and i've quoted this to you before there is no more sure token of an utterly prostate that means lying down if you're not familiar with that word There is no more sure token of an utterly prostate moral condition than the inability to be angry with sin and sinners. I read that, I don't know, 40 years ago and it's stuck with me ever since. It's so true. There's no more sure token of an utterly prostrate moral... Prostate, sorry, prostrate's a men's problem. Prostrate moral condition than the inability to be angry with sin and sinners. Look at verse 7 moving on verse 7 and the king said unto the man of god come home with me and refresh thyself and i will give thee a reward now this could well have looked like repentance he's asked uh, the lord smote him when he stretched his arm out when he threatened the man of god he couldn't pull it in again he asked the man of god to pray for him the man of god prays for him and now he says come home with me and refresh thyself and this might look like repentance perhaps but look at verse 33 of the same chapter after this thing jeroboam returned not from his evil way but made again of the lowest of the people priests of the high places so it wasn't real repentance at all whatever it might have looked like we have the same thing with pharaoh pharaoh would sometimes say to moses okay then i'll do such and such and he would make a promise and then he wouldn't keep it and moses uh, might have made the mistake of supposing at times that pharaoh was repentant but of course he never was even after he'd let them go out of egypt to remember finally let them go after out of egypt after 12 plagues had fallen on egypt he goes out after them finally decides to go out after them of course chasing them with his army so it was with herod you remember herod said to the wise men when they came go and and bring me word again that i might come and worship him but we know of course this was not herod's intention it might have looked good 
And uh, we need to be careful about just receiving a man or a woman too quickly upon a profession of faith. Sometimes it needs a long look. Timothy was told by Paul, uh, lay hands suddenly on no man. And uh, th there's, they're not here this morning, but there's one young man that comes here that might tell you in his last church, once he got saved, they got him on the platform in no time flat. That's laying hands suddenly on a man, and they ought to have waited. And they didn't do him any good, uh, he would tell you himself. So sometimes appearances, particularly when it comes to professions of salvation, might not be what they seem. So I say this looks like repentance from the king, but it was nothing more than momentary desperation, in fact. Come home with me, he says, verse 7, and refresh thyself, and I will give the reward. So now what looks like kindness and friendship, it really looks that way, is actually temptation to disobey God in eating and drinking where he ought not. It looks really good. It looks like maybe the king has come around. Come home with me and refresh thyself. But it's actually, in reality, temptation to disobey God in eating and drinking where he ought not. God has spoken, and that must be the man of God's guide. And so he says to the king in verse 9, For so it was charged me by the word of the Lord, saying, Eat no bread, nor drink water, nor turn again by the same way that thou camest. If you have unsaved parents or unsaved family, they will often encourage you to defy what you have learned to be true from the Lord. Mark it down. If we have unsaved friends, if we, have, if we have unsaved relatives, sometimes they will make fair speeches and those speeches will endeavour to encourage us away from the truth that we know we ought to hold that we receive from the Lord. And that's what's going on here. Your parents and your friends may genuinely feel concerned for you but by their unbelief they will tempt you also to disobedience as I say unsaved friends will do the same we need to be careful about the company we keep we need to be careful about our friendships very watchful um, we should be if we're still in touch with friends from our unconverted days if perhaps we are our principal aim, if we see them at all, should be to win them to Christ. Not just to share in the amusements, because actually they will, they will want to drag you down. Psalm 1, verse 1 says, Blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law doth he meditate day and night this will keep us from wrong company and if we should be in wrong company it will help us to keep ourselves sound and faithful in such company I've got a couple of friends that I used to we were in a band together when I was in my 20s we used to tour the country and I bumped into them well I didn't so much bump into them my, my friend's mother's funeral took place and I went to the funeral and I met these two guys and I have great affection for them you know they're my age we were at school together we were at grammar school together the three of us two of the other guys I, I haven't seen for a long time uh, our singer and the guitarist it was was that I'm talking about and I have great affection for these guys and it was a real pleasure for me to see them again but of course they're always talking about the band and this club and that club and so on and some of those clubs weren't too good either, you know, we were there till two o'clock in the morning playing the drums. Well, I was playing the drums, but, you know, entertaining the people uh, in these seedy clubs. And um, really, it's, it's nothing for me to be proud of, but this is all their conversation because they're still into this, you know. One, the one lad is still, one guy is still playing the guitar around Birmingham from time to time. And I have to be very careful, and I've been asking myself for some time, they said, you know, we meet up at such and such a place in Sully or in Sutton, on a Sunday, why don't you come and have a, a drink with us? And I'd love to see them. But the question is, will there really be an opportunity to, to witness? Are they really interested in about the Lord? I'm not sure that they are, so I haven't been. If we partake of the king's dainties, we will find ourselves unable to rebuke the king. And this would have been compromise for this man if he'd accepted the king's seeming 
generosity, it would have made his rebuke look rather hollow. We cannot rebuke the world system when we join it in sinful activities. Someone used to say, you, some of you will remember Mike Harper, he's been here and preaches with the Lord now. He used to say the church has most effect upon the world when it has the least to do with it. We might say a little bit more about that later. That is just not what they believe in so many churches now. They believe you must have as much to do with the world as possible in order to make them think we're good guys really and we're just like they are. And all you end up doing is corrupting the whole meeting, the whole church. Verse 8, moving on, verse 8. And the man of God said unto the king, If thou wilt give me half thy house, I will not go in with thee, neither will I eat bread nor drink water in this place. The same message we find, and we won't turn there, you can look at it at your leisure, I think it's round about Judges 13, the same message is clearly given to us in the life of Samson. He was a Nazarite, Samson was a Nazarite, that is to say he was separated to God, especially he had to grow his hair long and he was to abstain from wine. This was uh, what you did if you took a vow as a Nazarite, and Samson was such a, a man. And while he kept his hair long, and drank no wine, he was full of the power of the Holy Ghost. We read com uh, constantly that the Holy Ghost came upon him. So long as he maintained that separation, his hair was long and he refrained from wine, the Holy Ghost came upon him. And he was a fearful foe of the Philistines. But through, of course, as you know, his immoral philandering with Delilah, who is a picture of the world system, which pretends to love us, he has his hair cut, he had his hair cut and lost the power of God. That association, Delilah represents the world. When we defile our separation by association with the pretended love of the world, we're going to lose our power. The modern church thinks it must ape the world to win it, which is precisely the opposite of what we ought to do. This is why you go to many a church, you'll find a set of drums, you'll find coloured lights, You'll find microphones all on the platform, which they call a stage. Um, and you'll find maybe a brief message, lots of wit, lots of humour. Um, we've got to entertain the suckers so they'll, come again, so they'll come again next week. This is the way it is in so many of the modern churches. I love to read the old guys. I love to read the old Puritans. Boy, they were serious. They were so serious about serving God. God was a holy God as far as they were concerned. This book was precious. Nothing else should waste our time when we have the opportunity to read and study this book together and to hear it preached. So as I say, the modern church thinks it must ape the world to win it, which is precisely the opposite of the truth. We don't ape it, we separate ourselves from it. And if anybody wants to find the Lord, they've come to the right place. If we're given the word God, they've come to the right place. Some preachers' power is their wit, some their intelligence, some their excitement, some their doctrinal novelties, some their faux miracles, but God's power to convert and edify can only come from separated and devoted Christians. If we're weak and effective, we need to ask ourselves, how much are we taking pleasure in this world? Inasmuch as we fellowship with worldliness, by so much shall our witness be weakened. The man of God replies to the king in verse 8, I will not go in with thee. He might have said, and in effect he did, the word of God is more important to me than even your invitation, O king. If you had an invitation from the queen to go to Buckingham Palace, uh, but she wanted you to dress like a clown, what would you do? Would you prepare to make a fool of yourself to go? Or would you say, well, your majesty, I'm so thankful, so, so kind of you to offer, but I'm afraid I'm not coming dressed as a clown. The word of God is more important to us than to this man than even the king's invitation. Or as Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego said to Nebuchadnezzar, Be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Now in the case before us this morning, the man of God refuses earthly benefits. He uses the temptation of earthly benefits. Come, and, come home and eat and refresh thyself. 
But in the case of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, they resist earthly threatenings. So the one man is tempted on the one hand by good things and the other man is threatened on the other, both to be, to be disobedient by, by threatenings. Of course, you know from the Gospels when the Lord Jesus was, excuse me, was tempted, it was by seeming benefits. Turn the stone into bread after 40 days, the Bible tells us, he was hungry. And so the tempter comes and says, turn, if they be the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. It's a temptation to benefit. He was told, he was, he was suggested to him that he should throw himself off the temple. Uh, the, the applause of the people perhaps would be what he was being tempted with. The possession of the kingdoms of this world. These were all benefits that were being offered. That was the nature of that temptation. There was not so much a threat there as feigned love like we find here with the king. And so we can be tempted to disobedience either by benefits or by threats. And the devil doesn't succeed with one, he'll try the other. It was the Romans' way in the past to persecute believers, but as the church kept growing, I think it was Tertullian says, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. As the more and more the, the filthy popes and the filthy Roman Catholic uh, mercenaries murdered Christians, the stronger the church got until they realised we're going to change tack here so now it's we're separated brethren and now it's you know friendly overtures and now it's uh, let's get together and love one another but the, 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 the effects and the purpose is the same to separate us from the truth of God anyone but anyone whom you or, or I obey before God is an idol the Lord Jesus says seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness verse 9 for he was charged me by the word of the Lord saying eat no bread nor drink water nor turn again by the same way that they came us now let's apply this to ourselves stay away from the pleasures of the world system which includes its phony religion do not eat and drink from the storehouse of ungodliness Bethel here is a, is, a, is a picture of the world system particularly with its religion with, with which we are not to eat with which we are not to participate in now I'm not telling you you can't go to the Toby and have a, something to eat I'm talking about spiritually I'm not saying you can't if your friends invite you to the pub and you think there's a golden opportunity to witness I'd say go <laughs> if you feel sure that you can have an opportunity to witness there then don't be afraid of the fact that it's a pub go and witness Years ago, uh, when I was before I was an instructor, when I was working at the company, I was at Christmas time. They'd go up the pub, and I, it's never appealed to me. I was never much of a drinker before I was saved. Um, but they asked me if I wanted to go, and I felt it would be okay to go on this particular occasion. So I went and had a glass of coke, and they were they were all swigging the beer, wondering why I'd got a glass of coke. Now I didn't get much of a job opportunity to witness, but hopefully it was food for thought. And some of them knew, some of those guys at work, even the bosses, the top bosses knew that I was a Christian. And some of them, because I do things like this occasionally, I'm not boasting, I'm just telling you. Uh, you know, I'd have a glass of Coke with all of them. The boss, I remember we went, on, we went to Athens once on a marketing trip, six days to Athens, and one of the senior men sat on my table and queried me all night about what I believed. Clearly he was a, he was a desperate man, he was drinking too much, and, the, you know, we just sat together... And I hadn't pr pr previously witnessed him, but he knew I was a Christian. Maybe because I just had a glass of Coke in the pub, I don't know. Verse 11. Now there dwelt an old prophet in Bethel, and his sons came and told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel. An old prophet. They say, don't they, there's no fool like an old fool. If we're still foolish when we're old, we're foolish indeed. I mean, the millennials these days, they think you're, you're stupid if you're old anyway. But this, that's not biblical, of course. As a general rule, we ought to grow wiser as we grow older. And I trust that most of us do. But these days, in the world system, of course, it's the young that are prized. It's those who have an experience. And I'm not criticising young people. Don't think that for a moment. But they are put above the elderly folks these days in our society. Old folks are useless eaters that are drained on the economy. Uh, they take up the hospital beds and so on and so on and so on. Although they're a nice little earner when it comes to uh, pharmaceuticals, of course. 
uh, and the children, the youngsters are far more popular, but there's no fool like an old fool. Now old saints ought to be an inspiration. We have a man here who's called an old prophet, and he was, as we saw, as he prophesied around the table. Um, old saints ought to be an inspiration. But sometimes, and you've met them sadly like this man, they're more of a snare than an inspiration. I'll read you briefly what Dr. Ruckman says here, because it's worth repeating. This old prophet was raised up to destroy young ministers. That was his calling, in quotes. He was an orthodox, conservative, fundamentalist contending for the faith. His ministry was putting young men whom God called out of the ministry by getting them to disobey the word of God, claiming that he had a revelation superior to what God said from the original, of course. You know, don't you, some of you know this, I'm sure you do, that one of the ways they get you away from the old book is to say, well, the Greek really says, the original really says, what does the original say? As though God had nothing to do with giving us an English Bible. And you find those people, they, they get off into cloud cuckoo land before very long. Dr. Rockman continues, he was not a prophet like the younger one. He was a Bible-correcting apostate who, like Muhammad, got his revelation from an angel. He simply lied to the young man, and the young man took the historic position instead of what the book said. Modern apostate fundamental conservatives and evangelicals have put out of the ministry probably more than 5,000 preachers in America since 1901. The lion got them, 1 Peter 5.8, unquote. What flagrant and obvious idolatry cannot do as illustrated by the king, a more subtle approach as in the old prophets can. What the riches and the honour of the king couldn't accomplish, the mere bread and water of the old prophet could. What a solemn warning this is about making a god of our belly. The first temptation in Eden was food, as you are well aware. It was that tree, it was that fruit of the tree. People say it was an apple, it doesn't say it was an apple, does it? It was the fruit of the tree. It looked good, and Eve was tempted by it, and she drew Adam into her temptation. The first temptation that brought the downfall of the human race was food, something to eat. The first attack of the devil upon the Lord Jesus Christ, which we've already alluded to, was to turn the stones into bread, something to eat. Abraham's servant in Genesis 24, when he was sent to Rebekah's house, said, I will not eat until I have told mine errand. And the lesson here is we put spiritual things first. I will not eat until I have told mine errand. I'm always struck by that. And once he'd fully delivered his message that his master had given him, then he sat down to eat. We need to get our priorities right. Now, <laughs> some of us look as if we don't need such a warning. Some of you look as if you don't need a warning. And others of us, not so many this morning, maybe do, uh, which includes the preacher. One of the old 17th century English preachers complained how hard it was on a Sunday afternoon to preach, he said, to two pounds of beef and a pot of porter. One of the problems with having an all-day conference, you don't really want to be the after-dinner speaker. <laughs> it's probably going to be my luck this, come, this next seminar we're having. But when everybody's had a, a, a belly full of food, you know, we tend to nod off, and the, the poor speaker in the afternoon after lunch uh, has really got his work cut out. It was a hard thing, he said, on a Sunday afternoon to preach to two pounds of beef and a pot of porter. Verse 15. Then he said unto him, Come home with me and eat bread. Where did we hear that before? The temptation is the same, but now perhaps the man is a little more hungry. He's completed his ministry, he spoke with the king, he's on his way home, sitting under the oak tree, and by now perhaps his hunger has grown a little bit, and the focus now is upon the food. Come home with me. What does he say? And eat bread. Now, I, I would speculate, this is speculation, so do what you will with it, but perhaps Satan had heard the man of God's reply to the king. Satan would not necessarily have known what the Lord had said to that man of God before he set off for Bethel. But when he told the king, and surely Satan was interested to hear, and his ears were pricked up, you can be sure, when a man of God comes like this and poops the party. And you know, 
that's pretty much our business descriptions. We are to poop the party. <laughs> One of the reasons I'm not popular is because I'm a party pooper when it comes to worldliness. And we ought to be party poopers when everybody just wants to have a belly full of beer uh, and, you know, never return any thanks and so on. Uh, of course, the early Christians were hated for this because they were party poopers. Because God was more important, even than fellowship with the king. So I speculate, as I say, but perhaps Satan had heard the man of God's reply to the king about not eating and drinking, and so put it into the heart of the old prophet. It's quite striking when you read Samson. Samson's secret was his long hair and his wine, his Nazarite ship, but the Philistines didn't know. And it's clear that Satan couldn't tell him. So, which is why that just puts a bit of doubt over the, whether the old prophet got the information from. But Satan couldn't tell those Philistines. They didn't know what was the source of his power. Maybe had they hadn't read the Bible, they might have figured it out. But, of course, the Philistines don't do that, do they? They Like the modern Philistines, they just cherry-pick. You only get the truth if you read it all, and you compare Scripture with Scripture. Um, and so you remember, they're telling, him, they're telling Delilah, find out, and they're already behind the curtains, find out what the secret of his power is, and he won't tell her at first, but she keeps pretending to love him. Crocodile tears, you said you loved me. You said you love me, you won't tell me your secret. And eventually, of course, under pressure from this whining woman, he breaks down, gives his secret away, his hair is cut, his power is lost, and he finds himself blinded, grinding meal for the Philistines. I'm just going to read you, because um, it's good. I've read this to you before. George Williams' comment on that particular verse, because it's very powerful. <clears throat> it says in you needn't turn there it says in uh, Judges 16 21 but the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with fetters of brass and he did grind in the prison house and William says the Philistines put his eyes out and degraded him to the abject position of provider of bread and sports such is ever the moral result of association with the world. The Christian loses his eyesight and liberty and becomes a mere purveyor of entertainments to the church. That is absolutely spot on. Absolutely spot on. The man of God was no doubt correct to answer the king as he did, but there are times when we were better silent than let the devil know our plans. Sometimes we need to be careful about telling people our business, particularly in these days with so much surveillance, when the church is so, the real church is so despised. Sometimes we might need to think twice before we tell our secrets. Now, like the king, the old prophet was also an idolater, but it wasn't the golden calf of King Jeroboam, but the man of God that was his idol. He may have thought as he saddled his ass, Kudos to me if I can get this great preacher to come and have dinner with me. People will think I'm as godly as he is. He'd made an idol out of the man of God. Of course, had he been so, God would have not had to bring somebody up from Judah. The old prophet lived in Bethel. God couldn't use him. And yet God let him live. Isn't this striking and extraordinary, these kind of paradoxes in the Bible? Here's a man in Bethel that God can't use, and God lets him live. He brings a man who he can use, and then he destroys him for his unfaithfulness. Well, I'm not going to speculate on that seeming paradox, but there's a reason for it, I'm sure, a good reason. Verse 18. He said unto him, I am a prophet also as thou art, and an angel spake unto me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with thee into thine house. An angel spake, he says. It was, I think, very likely an angel that spoke to Muhammad, but a fallen one. An angel might have spoken to Joseph Smith, the father of the Mormons, as he claims, but a fallen one. Paul writes to the Galatians in the first chapter, at verse 8, But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, we have preached unto you, let him be a curse. Even if an angel comes, says Paul, and preaches something different, a curse upon him. And that curse, by the way, still stands. 
If a man preaches another gospel, there's a curse upon him. God hasn't lifted that. Now I believe, personally, that devils and fallen angels may be one and the same. And they may speak to you and I. So how shall we be safe? We must ask if the scriptures are contradicted. Does this new revelation that this person claims contradict what I know to be true from the word of God? If so, then we refuse it. Isaiah 8.20 says, To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. I was quite impressed when, uh, I don't know if it was Jack Mormon came here or was it when I heard him somewhere else and he said it more than once, truth speaks first. Truth speaks first. That's what happened in the garden. God told Adam and Eve first. And then Satan comes along and lies. You remember the rebellion of Absalom, David's son, when David had to flee the city. And two of David's friends, one was his counsellor, the other was his friend, Ahitophel was his counsellor, and Hushai was his friend. They both gave counsel to Absalom. And Ahitophel spoke first. He hated David, and I can't go into the reasons for that, but he spoke first, and he told the truth. And had Absalom listened to Ahitophel, he would have defeated David. But then Hushai, who was in league with David secretly, gave an alternative, and Jeroboam believed the second voice and lost his life. So he got the truth first, Absalom did, from Ahitophel, but he chose to follow Hushai, who counseled second, and it cost him his life, Absalom, that is. The old prophet says, An angel spake unto me, now let me bring this up to date for you. Here's the old prophet in modern parlance. Oh, I see you use that old Bible. God has given me a new revelation. God may have blessed that old King James, but he has spoken again since then. I, I am a prophet also, as, as thou art, so you can trust me. Besides, my boy, I'm much older and wiser than you one gets the impression that this this man of God was a young man and the old prophet somehow uh, just just you know what shall we say impressed by his pseudo wisdom by his years like I say there's no fool like an old fool in effect what he's saying is God has given me a new revelation we're told all the time that the new bibles are better that the poor King James translators never had the right manuscripts so they wrote in old Elizabethan English uh, and of course they themselves will tell you it's not Elizabethan English neither is it Jacobean English it's Biblical English you've only got to compare what they write at the, the preface the, the, uh, what do they call it what they wrote to King James at the opening and compare the language there with the language of the Bible and you find they're not the same this is not in, is, is Elizabethan language nor is it Jacobean friend of mine who we've been praying for used to say to me and it, it's wrong but it's funny he used to say to me the King James Bible is good news for Elizabethan men <laughs> which I think is funny but it's not true because it's not Elizabethan language neither is it Jacobean language the old prophet was saying my new Bible is not so strict as yours you do not need to worry about strict things like fornication and sodomy. You needn't preach about hell and all that 17th century hellfire stuff. Lighten up! Don't be so hateful. And that's what the modern Bibles want people to do. They want it to lighten up. Uh, someone I know asked a man outright, are you a sodomite? And got himself into a little bit of a tangle on account of it. And uh, I was telling a friend, we were praying for this young man, and my friend said to me, is that the word he used? I said, that's the word he used. That's the, that's the word we should use, because it reminds them of their destiny. And it, nothing wrong with it. If it's in this book, there's nothing wrong with it. There's some other words, you know, one or two that we don't use these days, but there's nothing wrong with it if it's in this book. Look at the consequences in, in Proverbs 7 I'll read it to you Proverbs 7 because both the king and the old prophet really are encouraging worldliness 
And we have a woman in Proverbs 7 who speaks of the world, and she speaks of a world religious system. And in Proverbs 7 and verse 21, with her much fair speech she caused him to yield, with the flattering of her lips she forced him. He goeth after her straightway as an ox goeth to the slaughter, or as a fool to the correction of the stocks, till a dart strike through his liver, as a bird hastes to the snare, and knoweth not that it is for his life. That prophet, it's a sad story. It's a sad story. He was a man of God. He was a great man of God. But did not know that that one error was going to cost him his life. Verse 24. Hearken unto me now therefore, O ye children, and attend to the words of my mouth. Let not thine heart decline to her ways, go not astray in her paths, for she hath cast down many wounded, yea, many strong men have been slain by her. Her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. Verse 24, and with this we'll conclude. Verse 24 of our chapter 1 Kings 13, verse 24. And when he was gone... A lion met him by the way and slew him, and his carcass was cast in the way, and the ass stood by it, the lion also stood by the carcass. Now this will just illustrate a little further what I've just been saying about the danger of modern Bibles. Let's read the verse again. And when he was gone, a lion met him by the way and slew him, and his carcass was cast in the way, and the ass stood by it, the lion also stood by the carcass. Now look with me, please, at 1 Corinthians 9. I'd like you, if you will, to look at this with me. 1 Corinthians 9. Verse 27. 1 Corinthians 9 verse 27 But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection lest that by any means when I have preached to others I myself should be a castaway. Now you might wonder what a castaway is. What did we read in 1 Kings 13 24? His carcass was cast in the way. So cast in the way is a castaway. It's a man who has once had a ministry but has been found useless and no longer has a ministry. That's what Paul's talking about. He's not talking about losing his salvation. He says, I keep under my body. And I think may well have had this man in mind here because it was food, you remember. It was that temptation to eat. Paul says, I keep under my body and bring it into subjection lest by any means when I have preached to others as that young prophet had, I myself should be a castaway. So just by the words here, in the words that the King James translators used, you have a definition given to you what Paul means by a castaway. The link is gone. I picked up four Bibles, the NIV, the ESV, the NSB, and they all read the same. In 1 Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians in 1 Kings 13, they say his body was thrown in the road. And in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, they say he was, Paul didn't want to be disqualified. There's no connection. The, the, the verbal link, the link of the words is God. And I also would suspect that the King James translators knew about this story and they knew what, what a castaway was and they chose, I'm not saying that they manipulated the Hebrew text, I'm, I'm sure they did not for a moment, but they thought carefully, they, they understood the passage, so they chose the words that would link those two ideas together, cast in the way. Uh, we're going to hopefully, God willing, the new year, I might do a couple of Saturday nights on the making of the King James Bible. Lancelot Andrews, for example, uh, could speak 15 modern languages and was fully acquainted with six ancient ones, including Hebrew, Syriac, Greek and Latin. So he was familiar. They were familiar with the Bible. Those guys knew the scriptures. And so no doubt there was a connection, I think it very strongly likely, a connection in their minds between what Paul said and what they wrote here. And strange to say, the new King James, which everybody tells us isn't so bad, which is based upon more of the same Greek and Hebrew text, they tell us that they've made the same change here as the NIV, the NASB. and the, They've done the same thing, thrown in the road and disqualified. 
So we're told we could use the NKJV because it's based upon the same text, but they've made the same translation bundles that the others have made. So let's just close then. There's no power without separation. That's, perhaps that's the thing we need to take away above all else this morning. There's no power where there's no separation. The church has the most influence on the world when it has the least to do with it. Another truth that's come through this morning, I trust, is a brother may tempt you and succeed where an unbeliever cannot. Truth speaks first. Beware of anything that has new written on it, especially when it comes to Bibles. So I think what we have in this chapter is a lesson in separation. It's always a challenge to me. Always a challenge to me. And every time I read it, something else just hits me between the eyes. But the Lord willing, perhaps it will be of help to some of the rest of us, some of you this morning. Amen.